I'm going to keep it reasonably light because it's the end of today and as you'll see throughout my talk I really know very oh, one second giving it all away yeah here we go um, why will I keep it reasonably light? I'll keep it reasonably light because I'm not a neurologist. I'm not clinically based and um, I actually know embarrassingly little about epilepsy. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, what I am is I'm an analytical chemist. I work out of uh, the School of Chemical Sciences at DCU. And I'm interested in measurement as an analytical chemist, and our health. And I suppose one of the, the pieces of technology that still doesn't cease to amaze me even today in terms of the science and the technology that's gone into it is the continuous glucose monitor. So looking at ways to measure what's going on in our body without having to go near blood. Um, so we've thought about the idea of uh, you know, the diagnostics through skin, um, the idea that it's non-invasive, the idea that we're not using blood and trying to understand what we can tell from the skin about our health, science, uh, our, about our health status. And I also love dogs and data, so that makes life interesting. Okay, so just to keep it light, as I promised, I'm just going to put forward uh, a question. So what do uh, the Romans, Linus Pauling, a Nobel laureate winner, a mass spectrometer, and Joe Malone, the perfumer, what do they all have in common? So they all have um, capabilities in breath monitoring, actually. So Romans would have uh, used a smell from breath, a, a sweet smell from breath to uh, diagnose diabetes, for example, or that condition. And liver failure was also diagnosed by a smell coming off breath, um, a, a lovely rotten eggy smell uh, that uh, indicated liver failure. Linus Pauling then was the first person to um, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but the first person to really understand the composition of breath or the volatile composition coming um, off the body. A mass spectrometer then is the piece of instrumentation that we like in our lab um, that can really pull apart a kind of a gas mixture such as breath or, or other volatile mixtures um, and tell us exactly what's in that sample. So that's really useful, so they've probably maybe the best capability here. And Joe Malone, just obviously a very famous uh, perfumer, but she um, claims that she could smell her husband's adrenal cancer um, at, at one point. <clears throat> so about 50 years ago, as I said, Linus Pauling was, I think he was 20 years post uh, his Nobel award in chemistry. So this in, in 1971, he published the first paper, the first piece of evidence to show that our breath was not only just composed of the simple small gases like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. And this piece of data here is what we call a chromatogram. And it, each of the features along that piece of data indicates an individual component of breath. So from this data and the analysis that he ran, the testing he ran at that time, he, uh, he concluded that there is over 200 components to breath beyond the, the, the simple gases. Um, he couldn't identify them at that time. He didn't have uh, access, at least at that time, to a mass spectrometer, but he was the first person to tell us it was a complex mixture and to start thinking about the idea of what this type of matrix can tell us about our health. So our skin indeed also, inverted commas, breathes. And this is an image of our skin here where we see the, the glands um, 
in the skin and the secretions onto the skin from those glands. So there's sebum on the skin, there's sweat, and there's also a host of microbes like bacteria sitting on the skin that are essentially uh, gorging on these delicious secretions from skin to keep themselves alive, so they're nutrients for them. And as part of that complex process, we've got this emission from skin and we start wondering, you know, just like breath, what can it tell us about our health status? So we in our lab have looked at skin as opposed to breath for the last number of years. And one of the reasons we like to look at skin relative to breath is because it's a little bit simpler. We don't have uh, the, the composition of the gas emission doesn't depend on how we breathe. It doesn't have such high water content in it either. So it's a simpler um, emission to look at. It also, I suppose one of the limitations is that it, um, uh, the, the limitation is that it is emitted or the, the profile is much lower concentration or less, much lower flux coming off skin than there is, for example, off breath. So you're going to see uh, VOCs, I'll talk about them a little bit. They're volatile organic compounds. Um, and these are small organic compounds that can escape from our skin or our breath um, as gas, in the gas form. <clears throat> so they're produced, we think, through a, a variety of different processes, chemical, uh, metabolic, and through cellular processes uh, also. We said we, they come from the, the glands and the bacteria that sits on the skin. And this is the type of composition that, um, that we see coming off skin. Really not to labour on this, but just to say that the, the, the nature of that emission is comprised of things like acids, uh, aldehydes, alcohols are coming off our skin, even if we're not indulging. Um, but also the red bar there shows us We've just called it other because it's part of the emission that we just don't understand right now or you can't identify. So there's, we think there's, about over there's over 500 compounds that has been identified over the last number of years within the skin volatile emission. The breath composition is reported to have over 3,000 compounds reported. So there's a really rich chemistry here that maybe is, is, is untapped in some way and certainly not understood. So this brings me to the project that has been funded recently uh, through NeuroInsight. Um, so the, the project is called Epicent, and the objective of this work is to try to generate some robust scientific data as evidence of whether or not there is a VOC emission from the body related to epileptic seizure. Um, Dina Karen is the, is the research fellow. He's here today and he's, um, he's leading out on this project in my lab. It's going to be a two year research program that has just started last month and it's a collaboration between ourselves and DCU and Beaumont Hospital. Um, as, as we were you know, writing our grant and developing out our ideas, in parallel almost within DCU, another project was starting, to, starting out in terms of its funding cycle. And this is led by um, Professor Alan Smeaton um, in the School of Computing at DCU. And his objective is uh, around automating detection of signaling behavior from assistance dogs as they forecast the onset of epileptic seizure in humans. So I'll talk through the project again in a little bit after we go through some, some things. Um, but really the idea that was quite uh, serendipitous that these two projects started off together because um, the idea of scent and dogs, we can really start exploring that and trying to understand um, what's going on there, what evidence there is for, for this type of um, linkage. So what do we know then from the scientific literature about seizure, scent and dogs? <clears throat> um, so luckily for us, uh, a group in 
uh, UCL in uh, London published this paper just earlier this year um, and reviewed the area of the role that trained and untrained dogs uh, have in the detection and warning of seizures. So we were able to look at this and see what they conclude and what maybe the needs are within this area. You probably can't read this very clearly, but really the conclusions of this paper were that dogs have shown an ability to uh, detect and alert to epileptic seizure. Um, trained dogs distinguish from epileptic, epileptic seizures from non-epileptic seizures and the possibility that um, volatile organic compound profiling uh, could aid in this seizure detection. Now, the, the paper went on then um, to talk about a little bit more about the literature supporting this idea of volatile organic compounds, um, but it importantly talked about the limitations within the literature. So there's a lack of uh, well-controlled uh, studies there is around, around uh, the idea that dogs can um, respond to seizures in particular ways. But they do point out that advances in VOC profiling could actually help with uh, evidence supporting this. So this is, this is a good start for us, but we went to look at a couple of the papers that they refer to. So I'm just going to bring you through three of those, if that's okay. Again, we'll just keep it um, light. This is a paper probably of interest to this community because I know that Neil Powell has talked at this conference, I think maybe even twice, um, and he's presumably talked about his studies uh, where his approach was to look at un uh, sorry, pet dogs, so untrained dogs and their response to human epileptic seizures. So this study showed that, uh, this study recruited three epileptic patients and they donated their samples uh, depending on seizure stage um, and were categorized as such into this study. Um, then the group recruited 19 uh, pet dogs and looked at how they would respond, how they responded to the odors from those samples from these three um, patients. And what he found, or what they found really, was that although there was a difference between the dog's response to um, the dog's behavior when confronted with seizure associated odors, the, uh, compared to controls, the, the idea of seizure prediction was not shown in this paper. But it was certainly interesting to see that the, the idea that dogs' behaviour changed when the, uh, in the presence of odours of uh, patients with epilepsy. So that was, that's, that was published in 2021. Now, a couple of years before that, this paper was published, um, where this time five dogs were recruited for five patients. Uh, so five patients, again, donated samples at different stages of seizure and also donated samples at rest and during exercise. And sorry, the samples that I'm talking about here are sweat samples from the skin which are collected typically on cotton uh, gauze and then sealed and bagged and uh, brought to the, um, to, to the study or to the, the site of interest. So this study here um, was interesting in that, uh, I'm just going to see if I can play this, and maybe some of you have even seen this. No, it won't work. But what... What was happening here was that the, the, the video shows three dogs um, looking or assessing and um, stopping at all of these um, tin cans, which each contained a different sample, and that in all cases of the three dogs, um, they identified or they remained longest at the, epilep the sample where there was, uh, was taken during an ep epileptic seizure. There were five dogs all, all in total that identified, correctly identified um, the uh, seizure samples. 
three of them at 100% of the time and two of them at 70% uh, of the time. Um, so though it is, is interesting, it's still not robust enough for us to really categorically say that uh, we have a, a scent associated with seizure, but it's certainly very good evidence to prompt more research in the area. Um, this paper then was published in 2021. This is the last paper I want to talk about. And this took in 60 patients from an epileptic, epilepsy monitoring unit uh, where they collected over 600 samples, again, sweat samples, from these patients over the course of two years. They took on, I think, 14 dogs at this stage for this study where they used three or four dogs each time to, um, to assess the, uh, the seizure and pre-seizure samples that they, um, that they had collected from the patients. So in this case, the, I have the, some of the data here. As I said, there was over 600 samples collected. About 200 or 250 of those were during seizure. And the, um, the data that was returned in the paper was that the dogs sensed uh, the presence of seizure um, 193 times, um, but were correct 193 times if we look at the top line of the data, and were incorrect 40 times. Um, so this was this is is really quite strong data. Now the limitation in this paper is around how they trained their dogs. Um, and even in all of the papers that we see, the training of the dogs is different for each, um, for each paper. So no standardization, we can't compare across. But in this paper, um, they trained their dogs with a, a synthetic mixture of VOCs that they claim um, is representative of seizure in humans. Um, but they didn't declare what that concoction is or what that recipe is, presumably for some type of commercial reasons. So although the data is really nice, it has real limitations in us being convinced as scientists because we haven't been given all of the information. But it's not to say that, um, that we can't find this interesting and uh, take it as, again, a piece of evidence that builds a case for this. So let's think about dogs a little bit. Um, what do dogs have that we don't as humans? Well, their olfactory receptor gene number and type is, is really the key here. So if we think about a dog, they have about a thousand olfactory receptor genes. Um, now, an elephant has probably double that, about 2,000 of these genes. I'm not endorsing elephants. <laughs> um, but if we think about the human then, we have about 500, okay? It's not all down to the number though. The, the dogs, a dog's or canine's olfactory system, with that, a dog experiences scent much differently to a human. Um, and a couple of reasons for that, and one is that our airway and olfactory system are combined. We, we use the same channel of air to do both functions, whereas these are separate for a dog. So they have a dedicated path line or olfactory path line for, um, for processing um, smell. Another interesting thing about dogs is that they're, proportionally speaking, the area in their brain dedicated to olfaction or smell is about 40% bigger than, than humans. So when you start thinking about these things, it becomes very intriguing that this type of sensor, if you like, um, what its capabilities might be, particularly in medical detection. Um, okay, so what can we do? Um, can we do what dogs do and without training our uh, elephants, and this is the instrument that we use in the lab to, um, to analyze any skin samples that we collect, breath samples, or any gas sample that, uh, that we want. We would use what we call gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And gas chromatography would have been used by Linus Pauling for the, um, 
for the first analysis of breath, where he essentially separated out all the different components from breath using this piece of instrumentation. But as I said at the time, he didn't have what we have, uh, he didn't have access to a mass spectrometer at the time. So this is really what look, the instrument looks like, but we don't need to go into that uh, too much. Okay, so just suffice, so that's how we analyze the sample, but of course, how do we collect the sample? And this is really key from an, an analytical chemistry point of view, how we sample, how we take our sample will influence what we see in that sample. Um, so one of the ways in which we can do this is using what we call, um, uh, we use a, we take the skin and we place a headspace on it so we enclose it so we can trap the, the VOCs that are there and we place what we call, what is called a solid phase um, micro extraction fibre but really it's just a very, um, very, very porous, very high surface area sponge that gases or VOCs just love to stick to. So this is put into this headspace and we collect the, the sample in this way. And really, it's as simple as taking that sample then to the mass spectrometer, the GC mass spectrometer, separating out all our components, and then detecting and identifying them. And this here is a is again showing the number of features that we're seeing from a skin sample. Okay, so just looking at healthy skin for a minute. These are the I mentioned already that we we see acids, we see. Um, aldehydes and we see some, some alcohols coming off the skin. When we sample people over time, so we sample the same person uh, 20 times, we sample a couple of different people, we see some variations in that, but we do feel we have some stability um, around what we see in that profile. And what we're interested now, if this is in the normal population, is where we get uh, changes or dysregulations in those if indeed we do at all. Um, we've looked at different factors around uh, the healthy profile and the healthy persons. We've looked at age, how that influences our uh, profile. We've also looked at gender, and we've looked at skin conditions, which will obviously influence the, the bacteria on the skin and um, hence the, the profile. So I'm just not going to labour on these, um, maybe just to say that, you know, breath VOCs are interesting, a lot of research out around it, around respiratory disease, so lung cancer, um, asthma, um, COPD, and so on. So a lot of research around the idea of breath signatures being able to diagnose or monitor respiratory disease. But what I wanted to bring you to is um, some work that has come out of Manchester, and maybe you've heard this story before, but there is a, a Scottish, uh, sorry, Australian uh, nurse living in Scotland with her husband um, a couple of years ago, and she claimed that she could smell her husband's Parkinson's disease. So what, um, she hooked up with an analytical chemist in, uh, in Manchester, and they designed an experiment where they collected some of the sebum, the, the skin excretion from the patient, from a Parkinson's patient, and they fired this through a GC mass spec. And what they did was, as that sample was coming out of the GC, they diverted some of it to Joy, so that Joy could smell the different components coming off the sample. And she was uh, told to yell when she smelled the smell of that she related to Parkinson's. <laughs> So it was really interesting that uh, a, 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 an excellent paper came out uh, based on this, of which Joy was a, a, an author, um, determining the, the, the profile, the compounds that they believe are now responsible for Parkinson's disease. And this obviously opens up a huge opportunity for new types of diagnostic tools within this, uh, this disease so just to finish off, back to Epicent and what we want to do in, this, in these two years, we're going to work with Beaumont at the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit and we're going to take samples from patients um, from both the skin and also from breath. And we're going to look at them with our uh, GC mass spec and we're hoping to see changes depending on when we sample these patients 
in the volatile profile. Looking long term then to that uh, is obviously the idea of diagnostics, wearable sensors and how these can be used in terms of seizure alert and epilepsy man uh, management. So finally then, just to think about coming back to, Al to Professor Smeaton's project around um, assistance dogs and seizure, seizure prediction, where he is using um, wearable sensors and uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to um, train models around signaling behaviours, trained signaling behaviours that dogs have to, um, that can be used to alert to a pre-seizure or an oncoming seizure. Um, the link that they have in their project independently, and this is with, um, with some of the dog charities both in Ireland and across the UK, is that the trigger they will use for that, the training trigger that they will use for that signalling alert will be um, around smell. So this then brings us full circle almost. If we can work together with this project to determine if there is evidence for a uh, uh, signature in the in the VOC phase, um, what it would do then for reforming or bringing training programs along for seizure detection dogs. Um, so the idea of bringing data from wearable sensors, accelerometers, is what the dogs will wear uh, in order to, and while they're training in that signalling behaviour. Um, so the idea of combining the data from these um, it, enabling that best practice or a new type of practice in scent training and um, bringing AI and modeling in to inform the detection and data management of all of this is what we think will be uh, really exciting in the future. Um, so that is brings me to the end. I think we're just on time to finish the, the meeting and just to say thank you for listening um, to you all. This late stage in the day and just to thank a couple of people and collaborators that are um, helping with this work to date and hopefully going forward as well. And of course the funding agencies here, um, we need to thank them and this is my email address if anyone has, uh, if anyone would like to contact me.